This week, we'll look at the latest corruption scandal rocking South Africa's presidency. How did Cyril Ramaphosa, who came into office promising good governance and vowing to crack down on corruption, get tangled up in a corruption scandal of his own? We'll have an in-depth discussion of the inner workings of Africa's oldest liberation movement, the African National Congress. Also, Karine Kaneza Nantulia from Human Rights Watch talks to me about the state of human rights across the African continent and why she says the work of Africa's Rights Commission is more important than ever. Straight Talk Africa starts now. Hello there and welcome. I'm Heidi Adams. It's so great to be with you. Cyril Ramaphosa is not the first South African president or leader of the African National Congress party to be dogged by allegations of corruption. While graft claims do not surprise most South Africans, analysts say it's taking a toll on the ANC's popularity. Zahir Kasim reports for us from Johannesburg. Nelson Mandela's African National Congress may have brought freedom to South Africa, but that freedom has been marred by corruption allegations at the party's highest levels. The ANC faces a crisis after a report by an independent panel found President Cyril Ramaphosa may have broken the law and violated his oath of office. The panel's report says large amounts of foreign currency were stolen at Ramaphosa's private game farm in 2020 and that he failed to report that the money was missing. Ramaphosa has denied wrongdoing and he has not been charged with any crimes. On the streets of Johannesburg, South Africans react to the party's latest crisis. I'm always disappointed by the ANC. I don't have any faith in them. Uh, they don't do much for us. They do much for themselves and their families. I mean, I was very hopeful um, when there was the original change when the ANC came to power. And it's just been a systematic uh, disappointment um, over, the, over the decades of ANC uh, power and leadership. It's high time that we really need a change. We need to see all the social responsibility being delivered to the people. Despite the frustration of another scandal, experts say the ANC faces tough choices regarding Ramaphosa's future with the party. All the um, surveys that I'm aware of indicate that if Mr. Ramaphosa leaves the ANC, the level of support drops by anything between 5 and 10 percent, maybe even a bit more which leaves the party at somewhere between 35 and 45 percent national support. So that means they no longer have the majority to govern if we go to an election now. Analysts say that the party has seen declining support with every election due to its failure to provide basic services like clean water and electricity to the public. Former President Jacob Zuma's tenure was clouded by corruption allegations as the nation's infrastructure declined. An inquiry into state graft also found that under Zuma's watch, state anti-corruption units had been dismantled and law enforcement weakened. Ramaphosa campaigned on fighting graft and though it has been a long journey, one civil society watchdog, Corruption Watch, says Ramaphosa has made improvements. Prior to President Ramaphosa's appointment, or il uh, prior to his election into office, civil society wasn't allowed a seat at the table. We were often shunned, distrusted. Um, there was no real working relationship, whereas now I think there's quite a solidified relationship because the ANC government under Ramaphosa has taken a, an approach to say that fighting corruption is a whole of society initiative. It can't just be up to government or to up to law enforcement. So they're invo involving everybody. Ramaphosa says he will challenge the disciplinary report. Political analysts say he is a strong contender to remain the party's president at the upcoming ANC conference due to begin December 16th. Zahir Kassam for VOA News, Johannesburg. So how did South Africa's president, who came into office promising good governance and vowing to crack down on corruption, get tangled up in a corruption scandal of his own? Well, here to discuss this with me, I'm joined in studio by Chamano Makadi. He's a broadcast lecturer at Chwane University of Technology in South Africa. And also with us is Pivo Kushle Mnyandu. He's a professor of African studies at Howard University here in Washington. And of course, no stranger to the show. Um, gentlemen, what a pleasure it is to 
have a whole South African panel here to discuss with the South African politics. Welcome. Thank you so much. People, Kushle, I'm going to start with you. Can you briefly just give us sort of the top lines of how Cyril Ramaphosa got into this situation in the first place? Well, it's, it's quite a difficult job to do because it's been a haze of activity. Uh, well, it, first, the genesis would be June this year. A man called Mr. Frazier, who was an ex-head um, of SSA. SSA is basically a mixture between the CIA, Homeland Security type for South Africa, so intelligence in South Africa. He walked into a police station and laid charges against the president of South Africa. These charges included money laundering, defeating the ends of justice, and kidnapping. Basically amounting to that at some point in 2020, unbeknownst to South Africans, there was a theft that took place in a farm of the president. And this was a theft, of course, that, which is why we're here, a theft of lots of dollars, lot of um, money. So he's in trouble because you're not supposed to have many, that amount of money in South Africa in foreign currency. He didn't report this. And also the allegations that instead of reporting this to the police, he basically turned to the head of his presidential guard, which would be akin to an American president turning to the head of the Secret Service and saying, someone stole something for me, go and find out. So these people were pursued all the way to Namibia. Well, we don't, we're not clear on the facts, but it is alleged that they were taken back, interrogated, and we, not, we don't know whether it was at Mr. Ramaphosa's behest, but by agents um, acting on behalf, um, on action pursuant to this theft. So that's why we are here. Parliament says they want to um, investigate, and they um, basically activated Section 89, saying, well, we, we, which is the section that you can impeach a president if, um, uh, if they break the law or there is misconduct. And they had an independence panel, and this panel came back saying these grounds or there are questions that Mr. Ramaphosa must answer, and that's why we're here. Uh, Chamano, I want to get your take. We, um, you know, you work in this realm of media, a reporter covering South African politics for a long time yourself. Uh, if we look at some of the media coverage, it makes it seem like this is a political crisis for South Africa. Is it a political crisis for the whole country, or is it really a political crisis for Cyril Ramaphosa? Well, I think um, the, there's a fine dis distinction. Um, surely, a, it will be a crisis for the country in a sense that uh, there will be some kind of instability. Um, for example, I mean, if a country is uh, going for, for days, uh, perhaps maybe without a, a, a president, and by that I mean a person who is um, actively involved in the affairs of the country. Obviously, that then becomes a, a, you know, a crisis because uh, a number of uh, you know, things that uh, are going to be affected, surely it is going to be you know, the business of, 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 of the country, the day-to-day -day, you know, running of, uh, the, running of right. uh, you know, the country. So that then becomes a, a crisis within that mm. context. But obviously, uh, for Cyril Ramaphosa himself, it is um, out a big headache um, uh, for something like this to happen, uh, you know, days or weeks leading to a very important uh, conference for him. Obviously, uh, as we know, he is uh, contesting for the position of, uh, you know, president for the ANC. And should he, you know, get to be elected, um, to a certain extent, we can say, well, he stand a chance to become a president for the for the country uh, when we go into elections, depending on how those um, elections are going to come out. But um, it is a, a definitely a, a crisis for him, but also the organization itself, because it finds itself in a situation where um, there are elections that need to take place in 2024. Uh, what does all of this do? Obviously, it, um, it, 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 it works against them in a, in, in a, big, in a big way. Yeah. And, and for those who, who don't know, of course, in South Africa, we don't have direct elections. The president of the party in power becomes the president of the country. And that person can be recalled if they lose popularity inside the country, uh, inside the party. I mean, um, people, Kushle, um, just give us some idea of the inner workings of the ANC. Um, who are the actors vying for prominence of the, of the party and, and the presidency? And I'll come to you, Jamano, on that as well. Well, so I think that, that, that's why, uh, partly why we're here as well, because when Mr. Ramaphosa became president of the ANC. I was one of the people that actually voiced and, as, and voiced that we should be cautious as uh, to how much uh, action Mr. Ramaphosa may be able to do because he was constrained. Why? Because his victory was 
basically a draw between factions in the ANC, between those factions that had been aligned to his predecessor and the factions which is called RAT, they were talking about something called radical economic transformation. And then the, the factions aligned with Mr. Ramaphosa, the new dawn. So he was always constrained by Secretary General and, these, and others. Um, he was always constrained as to how much of reform he could do. So he failed to, uh, as a result, he failed to uh, have that much power to consolidate his power. And that is some, some of his supporters actually say that is exactly why he finds himself in this situation. Yeah, so obviously uh, there are um, confirmed candidates for the, you know, uh, position obviously of, of president. In this case, it would be Sura Ramaphosa uh, alongside uh, Zuelim Kize, the former, um, you know, health, health minister. Then you have a position of deputy, uh, you know, president. As it stands now, we have uh, David Mabuza, who is the current deputy president of the, can uh, of the ANC and the country, but uh, he, did, he did not make it to, 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 that, to that list, which is just you know, something else. But obviously, you have uh, someone like uh, uh, Paul Shatile, who is the current uh, treasurer general and also acting uh, secretary general of the organization, vying for the position of uh, a vice um, you know, president or deputy president. So <laughs> it is not known what is going to happen uh, by end of this election. Um, some are talking about the cat, the man who has always been referred to as the cat, uh, David <laughs> Mabuza. Are we going to see a nomination coming from the floor? Um, so, uh, honestly, um, anything is possible. Um, uh, but I guess it's really just a game of wait and see. And Joanna, we spoke about this before. That cat image has never left me since you meant, brought it to my attention the, f the first time. Uh, but um, can Cyril Ramaphosa people actually survive this, not just in the near term, but in the long term? Because we do have an election coming up in 2024, and that is the general election. I'm, I'm going, if I were to be clear with your um, viewers, I would say no, because there's a history. They, South Africa since 1994 has had five presidents. The first two, Nelson Mandela, and another one is, and, uh, he basically stopped being president on his own volition, so he retired early. The other one was a caretaker president. The other two, Mbeke and Zuba, were removed before the end of their second terms. So the South African uh, electorate is quite an itinerant and an impatient uh, voter. Those of you who are amongst us who like democracy might think this is good for, for, um, for holding people uh, accountable and so on and so forth. So if we're going by this history of South Africa, the presidents who had served the most of their time have been removed before they finish their terms. But here he might be removed before he finishes his first term. Now that's a big problem. If he has problems in his first term, we can't even speak of a second term, I think. Uh, and Chimano, what does all of this mean? for the ANC, all these, these problems inside the party, what does it mean for the party's dominance in South African politics? This idea that the ANC come election time can be assured that they are going to walk away with the majority of votes at the end of the day, um, especially with 2024 on the horizon. No, uh, definitely it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for them. Um, obviously, it's coming at a time uh, if you were to you know, go back to the previous election already, uh, they had you know, sort of, uh, there has been a decline. And going into 2024, um, obviously, uh, against this background, so that, that, that becomes a huge, huge call for concern for them. Um, but uh, I guess we'll wait and, 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 and see. But, you know, just going back to the question you are asking, um, you know, in relation to what, what, what does this really mean? Uh, I think... Uh, we are likely going to see a situation where uh, the ANC probably uh, get to a point of, um, you know, a coalition. We don't know, but mm. coalitions in South Africa, as we might have seen uh, in the different, you know, provinces, they are a bit of a problem. And let me tell you why I think they are a problem. Uh, today, uh, you know, Party A and B, they get into coalition. Uh, tomorrow they are no longer in good terms. What does it do then to, uh, you know, development? Confidence too yeah, yeah. in the yeah development because uh, it is the, the the things that needs to be to be done for the uh, citizens. Um, it is that uh, project that 
simply just uh, get stalled. Uh, nothing gets to, uh, you know, to be done going, going forward. Is We've this seen this even in Johannesburg, yeah. But is this a feature of South African politics precisely because there isn't a real, not credible, but powerful alternative to the ANC when you have sort of, um, I would say, weak opposition in terms of the numbers? People may go into coalitions based on grievances or problem they have with the ANC. We saw with COPE as well. Is that a problem when you don't have a strong, viable opposition to really take on a liberation movement with a stature of the ANC? Well, it's been a problem for a long time. In South Africa, the um, if I, my, my statistics serve me right, um, the, a, a no single opposition party has won more than uh, 23%. So there's been a, a ceiling for a coalition. But the ANC uh, in the last election got less than 60% for the first time. So the ANC is going down, the uh, opposition parties are going up, but they still have ceilings. So if you're looking at a democratic standpoint, uh, this is good to have coalitions because then uh, there is an, an, an elasticity that is there for the politicians to say, well, I could be removed next month. This is new for the South African landscape. And so if you're looking at accountability, democracy, well, that might be good. But I, I would agree with, with my brother that um, there is, a, a, there is a, a cantankerous nature of coalitions and a, a horse trading that might not lend itself well to a South Africa that needs to secure Mozambique security problems, get rid of load shedding, big problems, get rid of 28% unemployment, $5,000 you know, per capita GDP for the first time in 13 years. So this is not good if to be playing with people's lives, but it's good for accountability. Well, yeah, and, and the, the general theme from when you ask people on the street is the word disappointment um, and constant disappointment. It will be very interesting to watch. I'm going to ask you both. We have a few seconds. Yes or no answer. Does Cyril Ramaphosa survive this short term? Yes or no? He is likely <laughs> going to. South Africans can never say it something in one uh, word. He's likely going to, uh, you know, survive it. But, you know, if if one is just basing it on the outcomes of, um, you know, the meeting of the NEC uh, right. over the so over, over the weekend. Yes. Yeah, but, Probably yes. Yeah. Short term, yes or no? I took probability in school, in statistics. No. No. Okay. That's the shortest one word answer <laughs> we can get. Um, Tamana Makadi, what a pleasure to have. Safe travels back to South Africa. Thank you so much. But great to see you here in Washington. Um, Tamana Makadi is a broadcast lecturer at Chwane University of Technology. And of course, our dear friend, Pibu Kushle Nyanda, professor of African studies at Howard University here in Washington. Thank you so much, gentlemen, um, for joining me here. We're going to take a short break here and when Straight Talk Africa returns. My interview with Karim Kaneza Nantulia from Human Rights Watch about the state of human rights in African countries today. We'll have that interview for you after the break. We'll be right back. Straight Talk Africa, welcome back. December 10th is Human Rights Day, and today we're taking stock of the state of human rights in African countries. The African Commission on Human and People's Rights was established 35 years ago to protect and promote the rights of people across the African continent. Well, earlier I spoke to Human Rights Watch's Karina Kaneza Nantulia about the rights body and why she says its work is more important than ever. This is a quasi-judicial mechanism, it's important to highlight that, that was established in 1987 to uh, really promote and protect human rights and collective rights, as well as interpreting uh, the one charter that we have, the, Af the African Charter on Human and People's Rights that was established in 1981. The commission itself was established in 1987. And uh, when I wrote 
that the, 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 the piece, it was really just after uh, the Commission has celebrated its 35 years of existence. Um, and throughout its life, it has expanded um, the meaning and the implementation of human rights mechanisms, principles, standards on the continent. Um, and it's more important than ever today because of two things mainly. One is the continuation of human rights and humanitarian crisis across the continent. Mm -hmm. When you look at the, 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 the resurgence, of, for instance, of the uh, M23 armed group in Eastern Congo, when you look at the, uh, the, the continuation of um, uh, terrorist attacks by armed Islamist groups in the Sahel, in Mozambique, when you look at the, the, the and also the emergence of new threats to human rights, uh, hate speech, um, the, the, the violations that we see in the realm of, of, of digital rights, for instance, climate change and human rights violations where you have intercommunal violence. All this compendium of human rights violations make its work of promotion and protection and interpretation of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights very relevant and, and, um, and quite important. Uh, but let me just also add that it, it's also faced with deep, as a, a, a whole set of challenges. And the most important one being the political interference by AU member states and also African leaders' uh, lack of action and lack of inclina inclination to implement and follow suit on the African Commission's decisions and resolutions. I think sometimes it's hard to really grasp how broad a concept human rights is. Uh, but what are the hallmarks of human rights abuses in a society? I think it's what we see, what makes us anxious about the future of country X, Y or Z. I think it's to see the amount of protest we've seen across the continent. It's also about the, the, the plight of refugees and, and migrants. Um, there was a study that was done, um, I believe two or three years ago, where um, they looked at the number of refugees, um, the type of countries some of the highest numbers of refugees come from. And the result was that nine countries out of ten are under authoritarian rule. So you do, have, you do see a spike in, in crackdown against, you know, um, uh, civil society organizations, the shrinking of civic space, the violations that we see around the um, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the number. And, and I think the other element that is important to keep in mind is we're talking about the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Um, when you look at the number of organizations, when it was established in 1987, there was, you know, there was just a dozen of civil society organizations that had observer status. Today, we have more than 500. Uh, mm. that have, you know, that have observer status. Three organizations have recently been um, uh, denied observer status by the African Commission on the basis that the, the work that these organizations do uh, around issues of sexual orientation, gender and identity is not a, a, a right or a freedom that is, uh, that is protected within the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, which, which again, I think highlights the danger of what we're seeing right now, which is this rise of intolerance, okay. um, crackdown on, on dissent, on alternative views. And, and it's global. And it is global, absolutely. Are there really worrying hotspots of countries on the continent right now um, which have really bad human rights records? And similarly, are there countries that are actively making progress and putting the issue of human rights protections um, at the top of their agenda? I think right now what we see in different places on the continent is um, uh, the, the, a certain political um, uh, will from different, uh, from the African Union to initiate regional processes to address peace and security uh, uh, crisis. So it's not from a human rights perspective, 
it's from a peace and security perspective. Mm -hmm. And our call has so far has been that they have to have human rights at the center, at the heart of these regional uh, processes. And I can name at least two. One is the, um, uh, 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 the, the current regional initiative in Eastern Congo, where you have neighboring countries um, who are uh, under the leadership of Kenya and the, and the East African community uh, who, have, who, who have deployed a regional force um, to basically secure, um, to secure uh, the eastern part of Congo. However, uh, some, uh, the, 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 the pattern of abuse that we've seen in the region, uh, in the Great Lakes, has gone unaddressed for a very long time, for decades. And as, and as, lo and as long as those grievances because these, these, uh, these violations are anchored in community grievances. As long as these are not addressed, m the militarization of regional solution is not going to yield any result. Mm -hmm. So that is the first thing. The other thing is we see, and that's, there's some bright spots in terms of justice and accountability, for instance, where you have, for instance, um, in July recently, uh, the AU uh, has decided to operationalize an AU trust fund for the victims of Hissena Bre's uh, regime. And that's been, uh, it's been years in waiting. And now, recently, the AU has decided to up operationalize this, this trust fund. The other uh, positive development is the, the recent trial by the uh, Special Criminal Court in Central African Republic of three individuals uh, who have been accused of crimes against humanity and war crimes. Uh, that's a positive development. However, we, for instance, have in South Sudan a hybrid court uh, that was, uh, that's been established uh, and is still not implemented. Uh, and that's a hybrid court that would have had, that supposed to have uh, South Sudanese and African judges. It's a hybrid mechanism led by the African Union. And, and unfortunately, we're still waiting to see, uh, to see it uh, operationalized. Um, I think the other important uh, factor to keep in mind is that um, as much as we see few examples of positive development on justice, around justice and accountability, we also see a lack of action by African leaders on ongoing abuses that can lead to further abuses and atrocities. Ethiopia is a good example. Um, we have the ongoing uh, 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 terrorist attacks in the Sahel. We have Sudan that's still embroiled in a, in a, in a political crisis. Uh, up until now, African civil society um, organizations, including the African Commission on Human and People's Rights itself, have made various calls on the African Union to put pressure mm -hmm. on these different uh, uh, leaders, um, with, with, uh, but with no result. Karine Kanezan and Tuya, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming in and speaking to us. Thank you so much for inviting us. And that was Karine Kanezan and Tulia. She's the Deputy Director for Africa at Human Rights Watch, speaking to me earlier. And that is it for this edition of Straight Talk Africa. Of course, you can find more of our coverage on our website, voaafrica.com. And I do want to say thanks to all my guests. Thank you so much to all our affiliates airing the show across the African continent. And as always, thank you to you for joining us on television, radio, and for streaming with us online. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.